As I promised, we start our journey of the Julia language with something that may seem at odd to start with, the language modules and packages. Most of the time, you start uh, uh, with the basic syntax uh, of a language, the variables, how to write comments, for loops, functions, we'll go on them. However, packages are such an important and integrated part of the Julia language that I believe it is handy to start with. So, what are modules and packages? I am keep going using both terms. What's their difference? In Julia, modules are some logical grouping of program functionalities. Functions, custom defined types, constants, all these can be grouped in modules. As evident, modules also help in keeping the namespace the set of names from which the, variable, the various object of the program can be accessed clean. So that you can refer to module1.foo and uh, module2.foo object separately. Packages are modules, a single module with the same name of the package plus some metadata uh, that facilitate its discovery and uh, interplay with other modules, uh, where I find it, uh, which version I am using, which other packages and versions this uh, uh, package depends from, and so on. You see here the syntax to write a module. Very simply, you declare a new module and give it a name. Module names are customary starting with a capital letter. Then you write which module object should be exported that is available directly from the code outside the module itself. This is a way to provide an interface. Some object of the module that in other languages we would call public are directly available uh, Others, that in many object-oriented languages we would call private, are accessible only using their qualified name, their full name made of module name dot object name. The former are those objects that are exported. The latter are those that are not exported. There isn't a way in Julia to make something really private. All objects are accessible with their qualified name to the code outside the module. Then you write the module's code, the functions, uh, structures, etc. that are defined in the module. Again, by custom, this content is not uh, identified, as often a file is all dedicated to a single module, although this isn't required. There is no connection between physical files and modules like in Python, for example. A module can well span multiple files, or the opposite, a file can contain multiple modules. Finally, you close each module with the end keyword. Modules are organized hierarchically and all modules are children of the module main, the default module for global object in Julia, and each module defines its own set of global names. Note that while modules can have submodules, child modules, this is really, really rarely implemented in Julia. Rather, most authors prefer writing separate packages, so we are not going to see them. Anyhow, the syntax would be the one you would expect with writing one module inside another one to define the child modules and using the dot syntax to refer to it, for example, module one dot child b dot subchild three and so on. There are only three keywords important to remember when working with modules, include, import and using. 
However, the reverse of the medal is that they can do different things depending on how they are used. Starting with include, this is a function and it is called with a string, indicating the name relative or absolute of a file, like include file.gl. Note the quotation marks here that indicate that this function parameter is a string. Doing this, let's Julia virtually including the content of file.gl in the place where you write the include statement, like you would have written that code there instead of on a separate file. This isn't actually 100% true, as the included code would be evaluated in the global scope of the module where the include call occurs, occurs. That is, for example, if you call include uh, foo.jl from within a function, the included code doesn't have access to the local objects defined within the function, but only those global to the module. But this is a technique technicality as I never saw anyone including a file from within a function. The typical pattern is to define a new module and then include the various files that compose the module depending on the organization that you want to give to the module. Also, this typical workflow reflects the fact that it's important that the specific including statement is run only once, so you shouldn't include the same code multiple times, or the same code would be evaluated also multiple times, and this may lead to problems, for example, with the definition of structures. Import and using are used instead as keywords followed with a package or a module name, and uh, for import, optionally with a list of uh, objects in the modules, like import uh, foo, x, uh, y, z. When they are followed with a qualified name, absolute or relative, for example, main.x or .x and uh, note the dots, they look for a module that is already loaded and bring it into scope. The difference is that using uh, brings automatically into scope all the objects that uh, the module uh, exports, those that uh, the module list is in its uh, export uh, keyword, while import brings into scope, make available, only the module or the object explicitly listed in the import statement. So, for example, you have module foo that define x and y, but only x is exported. You can type using dot foo and uh, then access uh, uh, x directly, uh, while you can uh, still access y using the qualified name, the full path foo dot x, or you can use uh, import uh, dot foo and then uh, refer to both x and y as foo.x and uh, foo.y. Otherwise, when import or using uh, are followed by a single unqualified name or a list of uh, unqualified names, they do a slightly different job. They expect a package name and the package systems take care of uh, look up the correct version of uh, module X embedded inside the package X. It loads the modules and it bring it and uh, for using also it, its exported objects, it brings are bring into scope. So to sum up, you may are developing a module locally. You are writing a module foo in file foo.jl. You first include foo.jl and then you use using dot foo or import dot foo x y z or you want to use a package 
and you first add this package to your environment, we'll see this in a moment, and then you type using foo or import foo uh, x, y, z without the dot. Julia packages are essentially Git repository, not necessarily hosted on github.com, but include a module plus some metadata in a project.tom file and some other stuff like a test script, a subfolder doc from which the package documentation is built, etc. The commands that I show here under the hood issue various JIT commands. We will not cover how to develop a package. You can refer to the link here, but only on how to use existing packages. And you can refer to this link for a complete tutorial on how to develop a package in Julia. There are two, uh, actually three, uh, ways to work with the Julia package manager. The first one is uh, to load uh, the package uh, pkg package and then typically in a script run the commands as a pkg function like uh, pkg.add as shown in this screenshot on the left. The second one portrayed on uh, the screenshot here on the right is to enter a special package mode in the terminal and typing the keyword uh, of the squared uh, parentheses that close and then type there the commands you need as uh, you read them uh, here. Note that the package manager tell you also the environment that is currently acti active, not to be confused with the current directory where you are. More on this on the next slide. To exit this uh, special mode and go back to the Julia REPL, it is enough to press on the keyboard the back arrow. The comments are pretty self-explanatory. Status uh, returns the list of all packages available in that environment together with their installed version. Update update all the locally installed packages to the latest possible version, that is the latest version that is compatible with the other installed packages. Here something important. Pretty uniquely within package managers, Julia packages, w when uh, provide a compatible version of packages they depend to, must specify both the lower but also the upper range. So you can have packages that aren't on the latest version because they are kept back by other packages. While this requires that package managers continue keeping updating their packages to specify the correct dependency, uh, it strongly limits the risk that something stops working because a package got updated and then the package that it depends from doesn't work anymore with it. When you add a package using only its name, like uh, add uh, uh, data frames, Julia lookups the name in a registry, by default the public Julia registry, but you can set your own registry, for example if you work in a large organization and uh, want to use some private packages. And uh, Julia automatically verify the compatibility, clone the JIT repository of the package and install, that is check out, the latest compatible version. Otherwise, you can manually specify the version you want or even install an unregistered package by providing direc directly the JIT repository of the package. As I anticipated, one of the coolest features of Julia is its support for very light environments that facilitate the reproducibility of your scripts. There are two main reasons, main technical reasons that hallow this. The first one is that under the hood, as we saw, Julia packages are JIT repositories. 
So when you know the package version, you know the exact commit ID and the exact state of that package at that point. And it is a moment to switch from one version to the other. The second reason is that the packages you use in a project are not stored in the project directory, but rather centralized in a user-defined directory. For example, in Linux, it is slash home slash your username slash dot Julia. So you have, for example, on your laptop 30 projects that use four different versions of the data frames packages and only these four versions are stored in the .julia folder, not all the 30 copies. One environment or project is nothing else than a folder with a small metadata.tom file that lists all the packages used in that environment, including the dependencies, and their exact version. A sort of a list of ID package, ID version tuples. Here is an example. As the comment on the top says, this list is machine generated. Every time you add a package to an environment, the file keep tracking the package that you add, update or remove. So the beauty is that you don't need to take care of, of it. It is done automatically by Julia. To activate an environment, you simply activate the folder with the manifest file or the folder where you want it to be stored, either providing the full path or a relative one. Here, the single dot stands for the current directory. So here, we first set the current directory as the directory where the script is saved on disk and uh, we use for this uh, the dir uh, macro. And then we activate the same directory, that is we say we want to work with an environment in that directory. So the current directory is the path that serves as reference when you interact with the operating system for files input output. Uh, for example, to read a comma separated file or to save a plotting image. The environment is the directory where an associated metadata.tom lists all the available packages. The two can be the same directory, but also be different. If we provide activate with no arguments, uh, we switch back to the default Julia environment that depends on the Julia version, for example, v1.0 or v1.6. Now, think you have done your work and want to give the script and the input data to someone uh, uh, to reproduce your work. You just need to include with the script the manifest.tom file of the environment that you used and then this person or yourself after 20 years by typing activate directly where she saved the manifest file and then instantiate will have an environment with the exact packages and versions of the one that you use to make the script. And this include, if needed, automatically download and install all the packages that uh, uh, she may not have on her computer. There is only one caveat, actually. The version of Julia must also be the same. So the environment lists the version of uh, third party packages but not the version of the standard library packages. So to be precise, you also need to provide to this person the exact version of Julia that you used, like uh, for example 1.6.2, as this information is not stored in the environment. Finally, while we don't deal with implementing packages, 
You may have seen that packages repositories don't include a manifest.tom file, but rather a project.tom file. In project.tom file, there are informations about the package ID and the dependencies with the good ranges for each package. In the manifest.tom file, there is the exact actual dependence version. So, if you are developing an application, a project, and you want to guarantee reproducibility, you include in the repository, you keep under versioning the manifest.tom file. While if you develop a package that is to be used by other people, you check out in the repository the project.toms, and then each individual user of your package will have her or his manifest.tom specific to his hair installation.